uh, I do R&D with the EM Foundation on privacy and new knowledge uh, applications. And today I'm just going to present on something that I've been working on in the past two weeks uh, in co collaboration with uh, the, the proof of attendance team, that's Patricia right there. Thank you so much, Patricia, for distributing the high My pleasure, tokens. but it's not fair to say it's me. We are like seven, so please raise your hand before. Yeah, so today is all about how we use uh, these uh, proof of attendance tokens to enable anonymous voting using zero knowledge. And I am going to go into the demo, I'm going to go into the code, I'm going to explain how the system works, and talk about how this relates to mixers and other uh, applications of, the, of ZK uh, technology on Ethereum. So um, let's just think about like a use case. So, Let's say in Ethereum there's always drama, there's always like some controversial issue, and there's always like, like questions about whether we want to include this EIP into this hard fork, or whether we want to uh, come to some kind of community consensus on some issue. And some people say, okay, we can try to use um, an election or voting to, to, get to, to get some kind of like uh, resolution. But that's, that's fine and handy, but there are two problems with this. Uh, you can vote as long as you uh, have an address, which is not so good because you can create an address for free. And if you vote, you can find out other people's, well, anybody can see who voted for what, and there's a lack of privacy. So for this kind of use case, we solve for uh, privacy using Semaphore, which is a zero-knowledge signaling gadget, which I'll explain a bit later. And we solve identity by using the poll token because, for example, uh, at uh, DevCon, at F Global Events, at Hackathons, uh, Patricia's team will hand out all these tokens and each person only gets one. You claim the token to your address and now you own that um, NFT, uh, the ERC721 token, which, uh, which proves that you were at that event. And you could uh, combine these tokens and say that I was at F New York, I was at F Singapore, I was at DevCon 5, something like that. Um, so, we are combining these two components to do a very simple voting app. Uh, I want to explain how uh, you can use your knowledge through this app to do voting. So let's do a demo. Uh, if anybody is on the laptop and you already have your NFT uh, hope token, I would encourage you to go to one of us on app. Uh, it's on mainnet. So log in with your MetaMask, uh, your MetaMask uh, wallet that owns the on the address that owns the token, and you can click on register, and uh, you have to type in your your hope token ID, which you can find on the Ether scan. So for example, if I go to my MetaMask, uh, and go to Ether scan, I look at my uh, ERC721 tokens. You see that three days ago I claimed my uh, hope token. So this is my token ID is 4295, which is for my uh, which is for DevCon 5. I would type this token ID into this box and I'll register. So that's just one transaction. Uh, should cost less than less than one less than five cents. Uh, and then once you do that, you can go to vote and you'll be able to see the list of like, questions that RPD see that it with. And you can, uh, and now you can like, look at the answers. So, so you can see like, the proportion of people who voted yes or no. And now I'm just gonna do a quick demo of like, adding a question and answering a question. Uh, any suggestions for highly controversial topics? Uh, that have nothing to do with personal, like, no individuals, but uh, so no, no personal attacks, but any controversial issues that are going on right now. It could be fun if we could ask a question recurring holding the DevCon 4 token also and ask which DevCon was better at that in each country. Should DevCon 6 be held in Argentina or in Buenos Aires? I'd say obviously yes. <laughs> Let's do it, let's do it. Um, should? <laughs> Six. How do you spell the last 
I don't know. I still, ask the like the 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 in the crowd. E. Yeah, and S. O S. O S. Yeah. Okay. So A I R. A I R. Yes. 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 Very good. yes. Yep. Okay. It's gotta be a hundred percent for sure. That's uh, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. So what we're doing here is uh, the <laughs> registration happens on train. But for the sake of a demo, uh, uh, I'm doing a demo off train. However, just take note that everything I'm doing off train can also be done on train. So you need to pay do one transaction to get your registration. Everything else can be done off train. So right now I'm just you doing the registration bit off chain as well. Registration on chain. <coughs> what could you do it off chain as well? Um, like prove in zero knowledge that you own the proof token without ever posting anything to the chain. Uh, not the way that the pop token is implemented at this point because this is ERC to send you so if you register you have to say that this address holds this token. What we are proving is that uh, later on. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry if I'm forgetting. Yeah. yeah, but registration is the clear, it's the voting that's final. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we're just going to sign the, the uh, hash of the question and it's going to be submitted to my off chain database. And now I'm going to do the, the on-chain, I mean, I'm going to vote on the question, and this is where the magic happens. I'm going to prove that I am in the set of registered identities, uh, and also at the same time, send a signal, which is to answer yes to, uh, to the backend. The backend is going to verify that I am, that the proof is valid, but when they do that, they don't know which identity I am. Unless I'm the only one, then it's obvious. But if there were like 10 people who register and I make a proof, it only shows that I'm one of these 10 people. Right. So uh, this is like, we're using ZK Snacks. And ZK Snacks basically uh, are a way for you to verify computation without running the computation itself. And the, so there's like two, two main steps. The first step is to generate proof. And this is something pretty uh, cumbersome. It takes like half a minute to do. But the proof verification can be done in a very, very short time. Uh, and it can also be done on chain. For the sake of this uh, demo, the back end is doing the verification of chain in, the, in my server running somewhere. Uh, but, and you can generate proofs in the browser. And so what happens is that we generate proof in the browser, send to API, send to the back end, back end verifies the proof. Um, updates the database if the proof is valid. We also uh, have a mechanism where you cannot vote twice. And uh, this mimics the uh, on-chain behavior of the smart contract that prevents you from voting twice. So this is going to take a, like, another half of it. So. And I can jump into like the mechanisms that ZK Snacks, uh, how ZK Snacks work, but... Um, so I haven't got my, uh, let's say I um, have the set of the Pope token holders and then I mint a new Pope token because I came late to DevCon. Does it have to update your um, registry or how does it? Uh, you just have to register. No, so will it, will it just, will your circuits be able to just pull from the 721 contract or do you right. have to update your hash? Uh, we, the list of registered identities is whoever registered through this app. So. It, it, so if you claim your token, you can still have to register right. to use this app. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so the answer is yes. Uh, and I encourage anybody with a laptop to try this out. Unfortunately, it's not super mobile friendly, so I don't think that it will work on mobile yet. What's the URL? Sorry. Uh, one of us.app. One of us.app. <coughs> one of us. Uh, and this point. Uh, any questions before I jump into details? Yes. So when you vote, you don't actually like uh, make a transaction on chain directly, but throw it to an API so that your identity is not leaked. Right. Uh, okay. So in this case, we send the vote to a through off chain to the backend. But it's, the reason for that is because it's a demo and just want to demonstrate how it works. In a, in a better, in like a production application, the, you would send that vote like through Tor or something to an API of a relayer, 
that would uh, relay the, the proof to uh, the contract and receive a reward from the transaction. Um, that, that was something that I would cover a bit later. Yeah, but in this case, we're sending through an API not because we are uh, not because we have privacy, but because first of all, it's a demo, and second of all, even in production, we will send a proof off chain, and then the relay will send a proof onto onto the chain onto smart contract to 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 register the code. No, but but if we like make the transaction directly, then people will be right. able to easily assume that we are the one for right. So. Uh, the only transaction that can be linked to your address is the registration uh, transaction or the, tra or the transaction that adds a new question to the system. But when you answer a question, we generate a proof and send the proof to a third party relayer that does the transaction and pays a gas for your proof. Yeah. And that relayer is rewarded um, uh, by. So this is like on a tangent, but I'll just go into it anyway. Uh, in the on-chain version, one idea that we had is to uh, is that when you when you ask a question, you will have to uh, send some ETH along the question, and the ETH will be stored in the contract. And when you answer the question, uh, uh, the contract pays back a small reward to the relayer that sent the transaction, and that's why that's how the relayer is incentivized to relay the transaction in the first place. So that's how you get away with not paying the gas for for it. Yeah. Because the people who ask the question could subsidize the gas for that for, for the rest of the business. But for this demo it's entirely off chain, so I don't know so there's no complexity on that. Okay, so we now I just jump into like the technical uh, explanation of how this stuff works. Okay, so um, right, so just to summarize, uh, what you saw was entirely off-chain. Uh, registration happens on-chain, but there's only one that, that goes on-chain. Uh, there's a backend server that checks whether the, old, the user has the has a old token. Uh, it does the ZK snap proof verification off-chain, and those are stored in SQL database. And there's also a, uh, they also check the hash of the uh, uh, the answer and the identity uh, to prevent double signaling. So uh, I can explain what an external notifier is there, but uh, this is what prevents uh, the same user from signaling twice to a question or to or voting twice on a question. And this me this uh, mechanism that happens on chain is what I'm doing to mimic what the contract would do on chain. So on chain. Uh, as I mentioned just now, there's you have the relay reward mechanism, and the uh, smart contract verifies the ZK snap proof, uh, and only broadcasts the signal or the vote if the proof is valid. So what is going on here? So we have two layers. The first layer is basically the voting layer. Uh, it's a smart contract that takes in the questions and answers and registration, but uh, that's the uh, that's an interface on top of what we call semaphore. And Semaphore is like a base layer for uh, ZK snap or zero knowledge applications like this. So Semaphore is what we also use for Mixer, uh, but Semaphore is, so, is like super generalized. What it does basically um, is two things. First thing is that it allows you to register your identity. Second thing allows anybody in this pool of identities to signal an arbitrary string. So by signal, it means like broadcast any string to the Ethereum uh, blockchain. Uh, but when they do that, they have to prove that they are one of the registered identities uh, that had uh, registered themselves earlier. So from an attacker's point of view, all they know is that there's a list of registered identities and there's a list of signals, but we don't know which signal uh, is linked to which identity. <laughs> so. In the same way, an, an attacker knows there's a list of attendees who have registered onto this app. They know there's a bunch of votes, but they don't know which identity uh, is linked to which vote. Unless everybody votes yes to having that on six and one Cyrus, uh, or unless there is like only one person voting, then it's kind of obvious. So uh, this mechanism depends on 
for it to succeed, it has to have depends on having a large enough pool of registered identities who uh, who vote. Um, otherwise, uh, you can use heuristics to find out who voted for what. And semaphore is basically to reiterate is a base layer for these such applications. Other applications are like a mixer, uh, anonymous login, uh, even uh, probabilistic micropayments. So there's a, there are a few ideas that, uh, so this comes from Barry Python and Kubica, it comes from EF, and uh, they've been, uh, like, I think in other talks they've been talking about semaphore, and this is just one application of this. Yeah. Uh, okay, so before I go even deeper into ZK uh, the semaphore ZK circuit, uh, are there any questions about this? So if you want to use this uh, scene to do like national election, you first have to register everyone uh, on the chain, right? Which would be kind of expensive, right? Is that oh wow, uh, I, I can't claim that this would be useful for a national election because because uh, there's lot. The first of all, the logistics are uh, way too hard. Uh, the security is the stakes are way too high. And I, if someone, if this gets hacked, then then the country's election gets hacked, and it's not so fun. Um, <laughs> but what we're doing here is like analogous to, like, um, so it's for example in Singapore, where I'm from. Uh, there's this like, so Singapore's independence was like 1965, and even then, when there was there were elections, uh, people were told that their vote was secret. Uh, and up to today, every year, I mean, every five years of the election, uh, the government says your vote is secret because they want to instill a certain amount of um, trust that their vote will not be tracked. And and, the, and that's like super to believe that because if they don't believe that, they're not going to vote uh, uh, in the way that they want to, out of fear or out of some kind of like sense of being watched. And I think if we don't have that in Ethereum, then when we vote on the DAO, we are not necessarily voting for the best interest of the DAO. We might be voting for some kind of uh, some kind of other kind of incentive, which we don't really want to run align incentives to privacy. So this is just one option that might be able to help that. But I don't really think it might work for an election. <laughs> but in Singapore, they burn the votes every time there's an election. I mean, they burn the votes a few months after the election. So so you don't know who voted for what. As long as they are telling the truth, then your vote is secret. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I love how you instead of you managing the registry, you let the user register themselves. That can only be done with an identity token, which is kind of cool. Um, it would be interesting to let uh, the users add other identities because if you like to increase your amount, your your set, so I might register three or four other token holders, and then I register myself. So. Right. Yeah. Identity is a very tough, very tough question. Uh, so hmm. that's but that's that could be done separate of the of the ZK stuff component that we have. If it was to solve your six people voting for Buenos Aires problem, so I could have registered like you know there's six thousand tokens. I could have registered like a couple other ones before I registered my own token ID, and then I voted. I mean, we are assuming that each person only has one whole token. Yeah. Unless you steal someone else's token, There's nothing can do about that. No, I think he meant that he, he the registry, the registry. He has, he has there, there, there are six and he all controls. There are six yeah. actors who can, he controls them all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's an assumption that we assume that there's no collusion. Yeah. Uh, okay, so this is literally the last slide uh, because I expect everything to uh, diving into the ZK stacks might be a bit uh, complex, so I'm just going to do this very slowly and step by step. Uh, so, in this audience, how familiar are you with ZK stacks? Have you at least heard about it? All right, has anybody wrote a ZK stack circuit? Okay, has anybody... Um, all right, so let's just jump into the code, shall we? Yeah. 
uh, who doesn't know how uh, the Gestapo proof works? So, who doesn't know like the ABCs of the Gestapo? Should I go into the pipeline and like talk about proving keys, verification, verification keys, and things like that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think that's just I'll just do like the one one. So just to recap, uh, ZK snacks are basically uh, the ability to verify computation without right. So ZK snacks are basically the ability to verify a computation in a in a short amount of time, depend regardless of how large a computation is, um, without revealing certain inputs to the computation. So for example, let's say you want to say that uh, you have a function that. Uh, that I have some text, uh, and let's say this is a hash function, right? So let's say that you want to, you have this hash function. The hash of W is is some gibberish. So the first step you do is that you encode this function into what you call circuit, and now we have. Now we have a, a circuit and the two inputs. The first input is W and the second is H. The code of F is encoded <coughs> in, uh, in like a domain specific, specific language that's used to uh, program the circuit. But there's, a, there's an input W and an input H. So uh, we want to be able to prove that we know uh, W uh, we want to prove that we know that the uh, that we know the uh, plain text of a hash uh, without revealing what the plain text is. So this plain text is a secret input, and this is a public input. So um, even though I say that this is a function and this is a circuit, it's important to know that we don't think about circuits like. Uh, like black boxes. We don't think about them as input and output. We sort of think that uh, we think in terms of whether this equality holds. Uh, we want we want this uh, we're basically encoding a bunch of assert statements and require statements inside a circuit so that this circuit or this proof would be valid if and only if all the constraints hold. So we're not like it's not like a function in the in the traditional sense. So, uh, we take a circuit and we call it circuit C. Uh, and for ZK stack, what you do is something called a trusted setup. So, with a trusted setup, you take in uh, the circuit and then you run this process where you get, the, you get two keys and you get some toxic waste. So you run this process called trusted setup, you get a verification key, a proving key, and it also produces some uh, toxic waste which you must discard. Otherwise you can, you can uh, generate fake proofs. And I can talk more about uh, how to do this, how to discard this uh, in a way that's less untrustworthy. So, uh, when you want to generate a uh, ZK snack proof, you need a proving key. So with the proving key, so you generate proof. You need a circuit, you need the proving key, and you need the uh, witness. The witness is a secret input. <coughs> Do we need a public input? Don't think so, right? Okay, it could be bad. Well, we generate proof to me in the public, but I don't think so. 
we only verify it when it when we verify it, right? Yeah, let's just go with it. I'm just all inside the window. What? Public inputs are inside the windows. Public inputs are inside the windows. Ah, thank you. Yeah. So this is it's so it's so many details I just have to go off memory. Uh, so we generate the proof this way. And then right, then we get the proof. And when we want to verify the proof, we we use the uh, verification key and the public inputs H. So if this is true, it means that I know that I know the witness, I know the plain text of the of the hash H uh, given the verification key and the proof. If it's false, then I don't know it. So that's ZK Starts 101. The, uh, the big problem with ZK Starts is that you have this trusted setup where you need to generate uh, the proving key and verification key, but you also need to uh, discard the toxic waste. And this is something that is really troublesome to do because uh, the, way that, the best way to do this is through a multi-party computation where you have a bunch of people to do the trusted setup in step-by-step uh, -step phases. And you only need one person to be honest out of all these people who do this trusted setup. Uh, it's called the Powers of Tau Ceremony. And for Semaphore, we are doing this thing called the Perpetual Powers of Tau, where we are coordinating with more than 20 people so far to take part in the ceremony to generate, uh, to do the multi-party computation for our trusted setup. So as long as at least, as long as only one of these people is honest, uh, the whole thing can be trusted. Uh, and Zcash did this, uh, I think two years ago, with the sampling power, uh, powers and power upgrade, uh, trusted set. So this stuff is not new, but can be a bit like mind bending So please, please be patient while they're trying to navigate all this complex uh, stuff. So. We're going to take this and apply this to semaphore. Right? So just now we mentioned how the circuit, uh, this is super simple circuit, that uh, the function that uh, hashes a piece of text that returns a hash. So the semaphore is basically, um, uh, so wait, the circuit checks whether the hash matches the, uh, the hash input, the public input matches the hash of the witness or the secret. But semaphore is doing something a bit more complex. What we're doing with semaphore is proving three things. The first thing is that uh, we are proving that we have an I we have the uh, a valid Merkle proof to the Merkle root uh, stored in the smart contract uh, given. <coughs> Uh, given the identity commitment that we want to prove um, non issue So, what is an identity commitment? So earlier when we registered our uh, identity into the app, we, what we did was not just uh, submit a transaction, but along the transaction, there's the hash of an ED EDDSA public key and two random uh, strings. So this is uh, these are these all these identity commitments are stored in the uh, tree as the leaves of the Merkle tree, and the root of the Merkle tree is stored in the contract. It's stored in the semaphore contract. When we generate the Merkle proof, we download all the leaves, we generate the Merkle path, and uh, that's the Merkle proof. And we when we uh, and when we generate the proof. The, one of the private inputs uh, it goes into a circuit, and the circuit verifies the Merkle proof, uh, and only if the Merkle proof is valid, uh, along with the two other conditions, it will be a, a valid proof. So that's the first thing we do to prove that 
the user is indeed uh, no, so there's a first condition that needs to hold for this circuit to be valid. Right. Uh, any questions so far? Yeah. So if you don't know the answer, that's fine. I see a bunch of people wearing Zcon shirts, so maybe someone else will know the answer in the crowd. How does the, how, in terms of complexity, how much more complex is this than what Zcash does when they're signing transactions? This is like way simpler than Zcash. Really? Yeah. Okay. So Zcash is a super complex, like because this is just like one node if on a single de denomination. Um, uh, so what I mean is that for a mixer, uh, each leaf only represents a fixed amount. Uh, uh, in this case, it's just, so I'm not super familiar with, with uh, Zcash, but this is way simpler. Okay, that is one. Yeah. Uh, let me just log in. Istanbul hard fork. Uh, if we use a circuit which supports a Merkle tree of 20 levels, so that's to the power 20 uh, leaves that can be stored inside the contract, which is basically to the power 20 registrations, that takes like 30 seconds to generate a proof on the laptop, and that takes like uh, 800k gas to ver verify. Uh, I think it takes 1.1 million one gas to deposit to. But for this use case, uh, we lower the number of leaves, uh, lower the number of levels in the tree to 12. So 2 power 12 is like 4,096. Uh, and that's roughly the attendance of that car. Um, what is the second part of the question about? No, it's like the, the, the size of the circuit, right? Is, is driving the, 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 the power of the polynomial that you need for the. For the, uh, for the um, over the field, right? Over the over the curve. So if you're if you're if you're choosing if your power is, is, is not high enough, right, then the the verification is necessary. Even if it says true is actually false. Because because here because because this is only true up to an epsilon and the epsilon is is a function of the of the power of the polynomial. Right, I think I should defer the question to someone who's, who knows the math uh, at the lower level. Yeah. Okay. But that drives computation complexity, right? For the for the to, to, to generate the witness. Right, I'm not super sure about uh, So about like it. Zcash is like they started at like two, two billion, something like that. Yeah, something like that. I think they had the they had polynomials with the power of two billion. Right. I I will have to check with people who know the the details, which I do. Yeah. Alright, so anyway, so that was just the first part of the proof. Now we want to prove two other things. Uh, the second thing we want to prove is that the signal was only broadcasted once. Uh, which means that we want to prove that there were no double, uh, that we want to ensure that you cannot load twice. So, uh, there is something called a nullifier hash, which is a hash of the uh, identity nullifier, uh, which is one of the random value cells hashed along with the public key and uh, uh, when you when you uh, register into a smart contract, you also want to hash it along with the external nullifier, which is a hash of the question asked by the user. <coughs> and finally, the path. So the contract stores all the nullifier hashes, uh, and the circuit also ensures that the hash is valid just like how you hash it in this simple circuit. Uh, and finally, we also do uh, EBDSA signature verification to ensure that the public key that was uh, that's, that the owner uh, of the that the registrant has is valid. And this is an EBDSA public key, not an ECDSA public key. So. Uh, 
The reason for that is that EDDSA public keys are much more friendly and uh, much more friendly for ZK Snacks and not so much so for ECDSA keys. Uh, which means that ZK Snark applications on Ethereum have some challenges in terms of UI UX because these keys have to be stored somewhere other than the user's wallet, uh, such, as, such as in local storage. But just yesterday, there was a big announcement by MetaMask where they have a plugin system that lets you uh, have something called app keys. So that's something that we are going to explore and figure out if that's possible to use instead of storing the keys in local storage. So just to recap, uh, this Semaphore circuit uh, proves three things. That the user's identity is part of the set of registered identities, that the signal was only broadcasted once, and that the user truly owns the key that was used to, uh, uh, that, that like, truly owns the key because they had to sign a message and the, the, circuit, uh, the, uh, the circuit verifies the signature. So, uh, and also to recap, the signal that we are broadcasting is a hash of the answer. We are broadcasting a signal to a question, which is hash to become a external notifier. The semaphore contract supports multiple external notifiers, and that's how we uh, support multiple questions. Yeah. Uh, so, before we jump into more code, can we, any questions? Yeah, okay. Um, hmm. Yeah, tell you what, I will jump into the, uh, maybe I will jump into the uh, flow of how this whole thing works from start to, start to finish, from the UI all the way to the CK Snack circuit, just looking at the code. Sound good? Alright, right, so let's start from the front end and look at what we do uh, when we register. So it comes out the first thing that we did. Uh, basically, uh, this is like a React uh, web app. Uh, when we register, we generate an identity commitment. And this function basically uh, hashes together those three things. So we are using a uh, Peterson hash, uh, I mean a Peterson commitment, to hash the public key uh, of the user uh, and and two random values. And this UI is using something called lib semaphore, which is the like a NPM library that uh, extracts over a lot of the cryptographic operations that we need to use to use semaphore. So it sends it to the contract, uh, there's a transaction, when it's done, uh, uh, we just tell the user. And then, when you submit a question, this is where... <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> it's okay. So we hash a question, uh, let the user sign it using the person assign function, and we submit that to the backend database. Uh, I think what's more interesting if I show you what happens on, if it's done on chain. If it's done on chain, registration is the same because we already do that on chain. Uh, for on-chain registration, basically you insert, you just pass along the uh, identity commitment to the semaphore contract. 
when you submit a question, what we are doing is we adding an we are adding an external notifier to the Singapore contract, um, and we also uh, for this version of the of the voting app, we require the user to uh, send some ETH along with the uh, transaction, and this is what pays the relayers later on. So this 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 uh, this fee could be uh, any amount, but it should be enough to cover at least a few. Uh, a few votes, and then when you answer a question, we hash the answer, and we uh, first of all uh, check whether the question that is answered to exists, and then we submit this to the semaphore contract that, uh, along with the zk star proof, whose uh, parameters are A, B, and C. Uh, don't ask me why it's called A, B, and C. Uh, <laughs> And but also these are the public inputs to the ZK stack. Um, which hash function did you choose? Uh, hash function for, for answering a question? Uh, yeah, the answer hash. Yeah. Hang on. Yeah. Uh, the answer hash. We use the chunk to find this. Awesome. Yeah. But as long as it returns like 32 bytes. Yeah. yeah. So now let's go one layer deeper, by the inception, we're going deeper. Uh, we're going into the semaphore contract. So all this is open source, by the way. So if you if if you if you have like some kind of application that wants to use like zero knowledge, but you don't want to play around with building a whole new circuit, this might be what you need. Uh, it also helps that what we are, we are also doing like a trusted setup uh, and an audit for the same code. So when those are done, you won't have to run your own trusted, trusted setup or audit for this component uh, yourself. Alright, so insert identity, this is the function in Semaphore that adds the identity to the worker tree uh, on chain. And broadcasting a signal is where we first we basically uh, check whether the signal whether the signal at the zk stamp proof is valid, and then we just add it to the mapping of signals in the smart contract. And this function to check whether the snap proof is valid is here. Uh, So verify proof is is inside this smart contract called verify the so this smart contract is auto generated by a library called Circom and Circom is the JavaScript based library by IN3 that lets you write zk stack circuits and when you write a circuit you can uh, when you compile a circuit, you can also auto-generate this uh, solidity contract that allows you to uh, verify proofs. So now let's go one even one more layer deeper into the semaphore zk stack circuit. So uh, in this case, we are looking at. Uh, Alright, so circuits are made of components, and there's a main component, in this case the main component is semaphore. Um, this is where we define the signals, so these are public inputs, and these are private inputs. So the private inputs include the identity, the, the public key, the, and the components that uh, compose the identity commitment, as well as the signature that was uh, generated and the uh, worker path. Uh, as for the public inputs, those with this hash of the signal and the external notifier. Um, so this is where it gets really detailed and uh, 
there are a lot of projects using silicon such as um, ZK Roa that um, uh, like also do a lot of like Merkle tree verification. Um, I mean signature verification and Merkle tree uh, Merkle proofs, uh, but also it, but just in a different way because they're using it for like batch verification transactions. So uh, this so let's look at a simple example. So let's say you want to verify that the identity commitment is valid, which is you want to check whether the hash of the three point components, the public key, identity trapdoor, and identity nullifier, matches the given identity commitment. So uh, circuits have inputs and outputs. No, circuits have inputs, and as long as the inputs are valid, then the circuit is valid. Right. So uh, we have a component called a Pedersen component, um, like that does a Pedersen commitment, which is like a hash function that's friendly for snaps. And what we do is that we take the public key, uh, the bits of the public key, we loop through them and uh, assign them uh, into the uh, Pedersen hash component. And we do the same with the identity nullifier and identity trap down. So the thing about this uh, DSL is that you need to do a lot of like bit level operations, which is super tedious. Uh, and so credits all go to Kobe Gurkhan who wrote on this. Um, uh, yeah, someone way smarter than I am. Uh, and we do the same for other components that do other things about the with the ZK snap. And at the end of the day, if all these uh, all these constraints check out, then the whole circuit is added. And the uh, and moving up the stack, you'll see that uh, this you'll see this smart contract to verify the proof uh, return true. It will go up back to the semaphore uh, contract uh, that will pass uh, this function will will execute successfully. And uh, and that's how you do voting with a uh, semaphore. So uh, yeah, I know I covered a lot of like detail in this, and there's so much more to go. So I would encourage everybody to join the semaphore society uh, Telegram. So. This is where a lot of the research and development into uh, ZP Snacks is happening. And this is also where the mixer was born, the mixer that uses some of our spot. Uh, and it's just, yeah, the internet's not working for me right now, but uh, hang on. Uh, no idea. Yeah, um, so if you go to Obi Gokhan's GitHub, you can see the link to the Telegram group. And I encourage anybody to approach me for if you have any questions about how to use Semaphore and if you want to contribute and if you want to uh, deploy it for your own applications. Um, I am writing like something called Lib Semaphore, which is a npm library that lets you uh, use it more easily. And I'm going to write blog posts and documentation to help uh, developers to. Uh, integrate this better into uh, their apps. Um, yes? Uh, so you said you, it's pretty cool that you built this in two weeks, um, and I just was, uh, my curious thing is like, um, what were some of the harder, what were the challenges in trying to build, you know, something like this right. in two weeks? Um, it's done in two weeks because I copy pasted my own code from the mixer. Yeah. Um, like, if you go to the mixer, this is like uh, deploy on COVID test net. You see that the UI, uh, the UI build is like almost the same. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So this is like what, another application of Semaphore, which is the mixer. Uh, I gave a talk about this two days ago. Uh, you can basically like when you deposit F into the mixer, what you're doing is registering your identity, and when you withdraw, you are sending a signal. And because you cannot send the same signal twice, you cannot double spend. And because you cannot and because you cannot um, uh, link 
deposits to signals. It, because you cannot link signals to identities, you cannot link withdrawals from deposits. And it's how the mixer works using semaphore as a base layer. Yeah. So just to give a quick demonstration, like just now, uh, it's going to download the leaves of the local key, generate the local proof, uh, submit the proof to a relayer, which sends the transaction and pays a guess on the user's behalf, uh, and the user gets back the key. So it's like the same design for the application. Awesome. So I guess my question is like, what, were there any challenges, or is it right? Uh, challenges are. Oh my God. Uh, there's a ton of challenges because uh, I guess I guess the first thing is like so just wrapping your head around all the different types of nullifiers and different types of uh, cryptographic uh, primitives that I use. Like you can't even use like SHA-256 hash, even though it's fast and traditional computers. That's super slow in stacks. And getting to that understanding of like the fact that there are different hash functions that perform differently. Um, is itself like one of the hurdles that, that people have to get through to understand this, this whole thing because within Snacks the map is kind of different. So that's one of the abstractions that uh, we want to uh, help people not have to worry about when they use libsynaphore. Yeah. Let me show you the it's, uh, it's I'm still working on documentation and and guides, but it's on NPM, and uh, so all these functions should help developers to uh, use this system. Uh, I would have like seven minutes to go. Um, maybe I'll take like two more questions. Thank you so much. 